as you may or may not, or may, know the second novel from the world of Night Vale, It Devours, is coming out October 17th, a completely standalone page-turning Night Vale thriller you do not need to be caught up on the podcast or even have heard of the podcast to enjoy it, available for pre-order right now and... Jeffrey and I will be doing a book tour to celebrate the release of this novel, starting with a book release party in New York City, but then we are embarking on a truly massive book tour from Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine. If you live in a major city in the U.S., yes, we're probably coming to you. L.A.? Yes. Boston? Sure. Madison, Wisconsin? Hell yes. And even if you live in, say, Santa Cruz, Lansing, Iowa City, Ann Arbor, Rhinebeck, yes, we're coming to you too. We're doing almost 30 cities on this book tour. So if you live in the continental U.S., east, west, south, north, head over to welcometonightvale.com and click on books to see the closest event to you. These events will be Jeffrey and I discussing Night Vale with a whole variety of interesting folks and then talking to you and signing your books. But what about the famous Night Vale full cast live show? Well, don't miss Night Vale live on tour this September and October in Europe and this November and December in Texas, the Southwest, and the West Coast, and January and February in New Zealand and Australia, culminating in a show on the main stage of the Sydney Opera House. What is happening in this world? If you haven't seen a Night Vale live show, I don't know, you've really missed out on something special. And if you have seen one, we bring an entirely brand new show every time we return to town. See something you've never seen before. Welcome to nightvale.com and click on live shows. Stay tuned after this episode for a special peek at the new Night Vale Presents podcast, Conversations with People Who Hate Me. And hey, thanks. If you see something crawling across your floor in the dark, don't worry. It's probably just a tarantula. Welcome to Night Vale. Listeners, in this fast-paced world of community radio and local news, I think we've lost sight of the truly important thing, the individuals who make up our diverse community. So today, I want to try out a new segment I've put together called Citizen Spotlight, in which we will profile a randomly selected citizen diving deep into who they are, and maybe discovering some things about ourselves along the way. Oh, here's an intro I'm working on for it. Spotlights, roving in the night, hunting, closing in, but everything is backwards. The night is hot and bright. The spotlights are deep and black. Everything they touch turns to darkness. They are searching for the light. They consume it. That's a rough draft. I'm open to notes. Anyway, today's inaugural spotlight was curated by closing my eyes and pointing in the phone book. And so today we will talk about Sigrid Borg. She's a brand new citizen who has just arrived in Night Vale. I have here this classified dossier. We had a team of heist experts. Thanks, Janice. Steal from the Hall of Public Records. The dossier says that Sigrid was relocated to Nightvale as part of a witness protection program, and that Sigrid is not her real name, nor is she of the Scandinavian origin her name might suggest. Thus, all of the information we managed to obtain on Sigrid for this segment is fictional created by a government software program to ensure her total anonymity and in no way represents who she really is as a person. In all probability, it is in most ways the opposite of her true identity, but for her safety, it's important that we all believe this made-up biography is absolute fact. It is extremely, extremely important. She would be in great danger if anyone from the outside world started to doubt who she claimed to be. 
We'll get to our citizen spotlight momentarily. But first, as a way to make Sigrid feel more at home, I've asked other Night Vale citizens to reveal a dark secret that they've never shared. I will be reading those throughout today's broadcast. The first comes from Susan Escobar, second grade teacher at Night Vale Elementary School. She writes, One night, I was at school late, grading homework, and I heard strange sounds coming from the cafeteria. When I looked inside, I saw a giant mandala on the floor made entirely of frozen fish sticks. It seemed to be undulating and alive. When I blinked, it vanished. But every night I dream of flying toward a cloudless sky, and in the center of that sky is that fish stick mandala. And I wake before I reach it, but each dream a little closer. And the night that I reach that mandala in my dream is the night I will die. Thanks, Susan. Sounds fun. Now let's talk about Sigrid. Though new to town, Sigrid Borg was born in Nightvale and has lived here her entire life. Her parents were immigrants from the picturesque Swedish port city of Halmstad. She tries to go back at least once a year to visit her grandparents, a retired grade school teacher and a retired timber farmer who have a lovely cottage overlooking the mouth of the Nissan River, where it meets the North Sea. Sigrid has always been close with her grandparents, though in recent visits has become distressed at her grandmother's increased mental confusion and grandfather's drinking habits. She doesn't call them as often as she used to and feels guilty about that. She is torn between the desire to take more responsibility for their health and well-being and the desire to block the situation out of her mind completely as it has become a signifier of the irrevocable loss of her own childhood and a direct confrontation with morality itself. Sigrid's favorite food is Smorgastarta, a Scandinavian layer cake that is made of sandwiches and fish paste. Ask her to make it for your next big event. She has been carefully drilled by her witness protection handlers on the foods of her childhood and has almost got the hang of making them, although she has failed to acquire a taste for fish paste. Some fun facts that you may not know about Sigrid, despite having lived in the same town with her all your lives. She has a degree in marine hauntology from an online university. She has a disorder that makes it impossible for her to sweat or cry. She has served on the board of the Sand Wastes Conservation Fund for six and a half years. She is deeply embedded into our community and way of life. And now, another confession from a local resident about a dark secret. This one from my dear friend, Earl Harlan. It reads, On a Boy Scout training maneuver near the old dirt road, I witnessed the apparition of my 10-year-old self wearing the scout uniform of my youth. He trained with us all afternoon, and I tried not to give him any preferential treatment. As the afternoon passed, new memories appeared in my mind of training at 10 years old with a group of strangers, one of whom seemed familiar and stared at me constantly in horror. That's adorable. Thanks, Earl. Back to Citizen Spotlight. Sigrid spent her childhood in the hefty Sycamore Trailer Park near downtown. She didn't have many friends. She was shy in school. One year, she tried out for a solo in the school holiday pageant. For the audition, she sang a Flaky O's jingle that was very popular at the time, but no one took her seriously. They all thought she was making a joke. She apologized and faded back into the bleachers. She truly loved that jingle. It spoke to her soul. It made her feel something. She recorded it off the radio and listened to it often, 
rewinding and replaying it out at the picnic table on summer nights when the rest of her family was asleep. But she never listened to it again after the solo tryouts, because it only brought back the sound of the other kids laughing, of her teacher's scolding voice lecturing the class to take themselves seriously, or no one else would, and it made her feel ashamed. She eventually recorded over the tape with audio from a TV special about orphaned lion cubs. But, sometimes, under the hungry, sucking sounds of giant kittens drinking from baby bottles, she thought she could still hear the song. In seventh grade, she finally made some friends during the Unknown Creature Dissection Unit in science class. She wasn't squeamish, and her ability to identify and extract misshapen internal organs without flinching made her an attractive lab partner. Everyone thought she was new in town because they had never noticed her before. She still has that effect on people. In the spring of that year, someone asked her to the junior high dance. The theme was Heat Death of the Universe. The boys spent a lot of time licking the crepe paper decorations to dye their tongues bright colors and impress the girls. The girls were not impressed, but laughed anyway. Sigrid's date tried to lick her hand to see if the dye would come off on her skin. This caused Sigrid to feel a surge of strange, tingling panic, and she fled to the bathroom for 30 minutes. Her friends eventually found her and dragged her back into the gym. She danced with them for the rest of the night, hiding from the boys with the blue tongues. There were bountiful crops that year. Some say this was not a coincidence. Some say the junior high dance is a sacred crop fertility ritual outlined in the town charter, but kept secret from the children who participate. When the dance was canceled in the following years, due to the crepe paper dye related poisoning incident, Nightvale experienced extreme drought and locust plagues. Some say this, too, was not a coincidence. A quick bulletin board reminder, the reinstated junior high dance is coming up. May all you young citizens make lush and plentiful memories and have a cornucopia of fun. More Citizen Spotlight soon, but first, the weather. Words in the way, 
nothing can say, kisses can steal. Another secret confession. Ah, oh, what a treat. This one comes from iconic local celebrity and recent donut food truck entrepreneur, Lee Marvin. It says, There is a void. Within that void, a light. Within that light, a hand. Within that hand, a movement. Within that movement, a potential. Within that potential, everything that ever was. Thank you, Lee. And of course, a happy 30th birthday to you today. Citizen Spotlight Time In high school, Sigrid's left hand started to itch below the pinky finger. A small lump appeared, which grew slowly over time. She became self-conscious about this and wore bulky sweatshirts with long sleeves pulled over her hands, which was luckily a fashionable look then. The nurse at the health clinic assured her that it was nothing to be concerned about, but it kept growing. Eventually, it took the shape of what appeared to be a second, smaller pinky finger. She was even able to wiggle it if she concentrated very hard. As you may know, the hefty sycamore trailer park was built on the dried up shores of the old pesticide waste river, and Sigrid's father felt there might be some connection between this and the extra finger they decided to relocate. They moved into a two-story house by the train tracks, a fixer-upper that shook on its foundation twice a day when the train came through, and once or twice erratically every night when the secret night trains passed with their nameless and unspeakable cargoes. Sigrid's parents began to fight, often never having the money to fix up the fixer-upper, and they both spent as much time as possible away from home. Sigrid had a complicated relationship with her extra finger at this point, partially blaming it for the rift in her parents' relationship. Once, when Sigrid was alone in the house, she heard something creeping up the stairs. She hummed the flaky O's jingle till she couldn't hear it anymore, and then she started spending a lot more time away from home also. There was a small group of kids who hung out around the train tracks at night, so she started hanging out with them to avoid going home. They liked to smoke cigarettes and light off fireworks and dare each other to look at the secret night trains, although none of them ever did, as they all knew that to look at one of those trains meant an instant and painful death. They would talk and gossip about kids and teachers she'd never heard of before, and she began to wonder if they even went to her school. When she was hanging out with them, she would often glance up at the dark windows of her own empty house, just down the tracks, and see movement behind the glass, or soft white eyes staring out. During one of these movements, while she looked at the house, all her friends disappeared, and she found herself alone on the tracks, 
No sign of the teenagers that had been there mere seconds before. She never saw those kids again, but she often heard their voices and portable radios on the wind, and she spent her evenings wandering up and down the tracks looking for them. At the end of senior year, the high school yearbook featured fun awards for each student voted on by the class. Smartest girl and tallest boy and most likely to survive a mass extinction event and best smile. Every single student received a commemorative award, except for Sigrid. It wasn't intentional or out of spite. Everyone forgot that she existed. She was inexplicably absent during every school picture day throughout the years, never participated in any extracurricular activities, didn't speak up in class, got average grades, and ate lunch alone, which some say contributed to her lack of memorability. But she was there, and is here, and always has been. She belongs here. It's totally normal to forget someone you know, but you do, in fact, know her. Some of you know her very well. One time you went thrift store shopping together, and she picked out a jacket for you that was too big, but she said it looked great on you. It was fuzzy and resembled furniture upholstery, royal blue with gold stripes. The lining was ripped. She bought it for you. You found that old jacket recently, royal blue with gold stripes. You put it on. It almost fits now. You felt something that you hadn't felt before, sticking against your ribs, tucked into the ripped lining. You reached inside, and you pulled out a piece of notebook paper, folded into a hard little square. It was from Sigrid. It described a thing that she shouldn't have seen, and couldn't speak about. It instructed you to burn the note immediately, and you did. It instructed you to never acknowledge to her that you even received it. You can never tell anyone what the note said. If you do run into Sigrid, remember that she is a real person filled with blood and misshapen internal organs just like you and me. Everything I have told you about her is completely true. Well, none of it is technically true, but it was crafted by state-of-the-art technology to evoke a range of one to four feelings in the listener. And as we all know, feelings are real. And truth is in the mind of the beholder. And the beholder lives out in the scorched orchard under the floorboards of the old cherry-picking shack. Stay tuned next for a mysterious distress signal that requires urgent action, but is impossible to locate. On behalf of everyone here at Night Vale Community Radio, welcome to your new town, Sigrid, the town where you have lived your entire life. And to everyone else, good night, Night Vale. Good night. Welcome to Night Vale is a production of Night Vale Presents. This episode was written by Bree Williams with Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner and produced by Joseph Fink. The voice of Night Vale is Cecil Baldwin. Original music by Disparition. All of it can be found at disparition.info or at disparition.bandcamp.com. This episode's weather was Try, Try, Try by Rachel Sage. Find out more at rachelsage.com. Comments, questions, email us at info at welcometonightvale.com. Or follow us on Twitter at Night vale Radio. Or shout kind words at a chipmunk as it scampers through your yard. Check out welcometonightvale.com for more information on this show and our upcoming book tour, which is probably coming where you live, if you live anywhere. Today's proverb, be yourself, as if you had any choice in the matter. And now, we wanted to share with you the newest podcast from Night Vale Presents, created by voice of Carlos and amazing human being, Dylan Marin. I give you conversations with people who hate me. Josh, you said that you're about to graduate high school, right? Mm-hmm. How is high school for you? 
Am I allowed to use the H-E double hockey stick word? Oh, yeah. You're allowed to. It was hell. <laughs> really? And it's still hell right now, even though it's only two weeks left. That's awful. I mean, I also just want to let you know, Josh, I was bullied in high school, too. Hi, I'm Dylan Marin, and this is Conversations with People Who Hate Me, an interview series where I have in-depth conversations with some of the strangers who have sent me the most hateful or negative messages online. Why did they send these messages? Well... That's essentially what this podcast is trying to figure out. As a video maker and writer, my work focuses on social justice issues, and I've been fortunate enough to find a large audience for that work, but that of course means that I found a lot of detractors too. Now we released the first episode last week and the response has been wonderful, so thank you so much for listening. But so many people have asked me why I would put myself through this, and I totally get the curiosity, but I can explain. I was bullied all throughout middle school and high school. People, especially the other boys, gave me a pretty hard time, and I was a soft-spoken, closeted gay kid with zero self-confidence, so I guess my bullies saw me as an easy target. To explain this to me and, and make me feel better, my mom would remind me that these bullies were probably hurt themselves, and that they were taking it out on me. I was kind of frustrated as a seventh grader when she told me this. I mean, it seemed completely futile. Me knowing that they were hurting too wasn't going to stop them from making fun of my high voice or stop them from spreading rumors that I was gay. Spoiler alert, those weren't just rumors. But as I got older, my mom's advice started to sink in, and I started to feel curious about what was hurting my bullies. Now, this was not to excuse their behavior, but only to kind of humanize them. I'm sharing this with you only because the hate messages I get online sometimes feel very similar to the bullying I experienced as a kid. The things that my online haters rag on today, things like my sexuality and my voice, are the same things that my bullies focused on when I was younger. I'm also sharing this with you because this episode deals with bullying and the idea that hurt people hurt people. Now, a quick production note before we begin, you'll hear some wind interference on my guest's side of the call. I apologize in advance for the audio quality, but I also felt that the content of what he was saying was so important that the audio quality was ultimately secondary to what was being said. So today I'm talking to Josh, and a little while ago, Josh sent me this message. You're a moron. You're the reason this country is dividing itself. All of your videos are merely opinion and an awful opinion, I must say. Just stop. Plus, being gay is a sin. So, I am going to call Josh right now. Hey, is this Josh? Hey, yeah, it is. How's your day going so far? It's good. How are you? Oh, I'm good. So, Josh, what inspired you to send that message to me? What sparked that first message? I was just angry about it all. It was just a lot of, it was a buildup of all your multiple videos you made of stuff, and I just got mad. I'm pretty sure the video was something about police brutality, and I have a lot of family in the police force, and it just kind of angered me. Can you remember what specific uh, video I made that uh, sparked that first message? Uh, police brutality unboxing. Unboxing police brutality. Okay. So All right. So quick context. Josh is referring to a video from my unboxing series. And you know the real unboxing videos where popular YouTubers unbox the latest electronic gadgets? Okay, so I satirized those videos by unboxing intangible ideologies like Islamophobia and rape culture. Now here is a clip from the video that Josh is referring to. The people who say it doesn't exist are full of shit. Today, I'm unboxing police brutality. Okay, so um, tell me a little about you. Well, my name is Josh. I'm 18 years old. I am currently a senior in high school, graduating in two weeks. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah. I am going to a local junior college in my uh, hometown, and I will be going to be an occupational therapist assistant, which is basically... You get in a car accident or any accident and lose mobility, 
of any part of your body. I will basically be there to perform everyday activities with you, as little as walking or holding something until you can, it's basically rehab until you can get the mobility back to yourself. That sounds awesome. So what, what is, what makes you want to go into that field? Originally, I was wanting to go into counseling. I love to help people, even though a lot of times I don't show that. I love everyone. I love to help. But counseling would take a lot more time in college, a lot more money that I cannot afford myself and neither can my family. And so I just thought it'd be a good idea to go into that. Um, so you were telling me that you responded pretty negatively to my video uh, against police brutality, and you said it was lar- it was largely because you have a lot of police in your family? I had a ton of police officers in my family, and because of that, anytime I walked past the police officer, military person, fireman, I just stopped to thank them because, that's, in my mind, every day they put their lives on the line for us. And every day they go out thinking, knowing that it could be their last. Some person could pull a gun on them. And they do it to protect us. No, and, and what do you think gave you that sense of respect for law enforcement? I've gotten a lot of my mind thinking, a lot of my thoughts from my parents, uh, my family being part of law enforcement, my family being part of military, all that intertwined together. I just have a ton of respect for what they do. Do you think criticizing or talking about police brutality is a disrespect to uh, police officers? I don't think it's a direct disrespect, but a lot of times when you see people talking about police brutality, they're encompassing the entire police force, which I think is unfair. Because like I said many times, a lot of other people... There's some bad people out there. There's some bad people that's going to be on the police force, but I can guarantee you that the majority of officers, policemen, all that are good. Sometimes they they have like one or two seconds to make a decision on what they need to do, if they need to try and stop them or if they need to shoot them for protection of others. So it's a very hard place to put in unless you've done it before. Well, I I agree that... um it is a challenging job to be a police officer, but I think as, as some data has shown, there's a lot of split second decisions that is, uh, largely based on, uh, racial bias, right? A split second decision that a police officer will make with an unarmed black person is different than a split second decision that a police officer will make with an unarmed white person. Do you feel like you agree with that or disagree with that? That's really a tough one because all the time on the news when it's about police brutality, it's about an African-American, a black person. You hardly ever see anything on police brutality about white people. That's because the news media wants to keep the Black Lives Matter movement ahead. So whenever there's something that happens to a black person, it's a lot larger of news than it is for a white person. Hmm. So I feel like the black people... uh, they get more media attention than the white people do just because they're black. And I would actually disagree with you on that because I think the media actually does a not good job of covering instances of police brutality. Um, I feel like there are many more instances that we don't cover. Um, You were saying that you feel like the media manipulates the conversation to favor Black Lives Matter. Um, What is your take on the media right now? Right now, I'm not very fond of any media because the media seems to only be covering the bad parts of the world right now. It seems to stray away from the good parts because people seem to enjoy watching the negative things happening in this world because they like to just fight with each other about it. And I don't think that's just America either. That's just everywhere nowadays. Hmm. And it's just sad because there's a lot of good things going on in this world. What what do you think some of those good things are, or or what is like the the beauty you see in the world right now? I see a lot of people fighting for the cancer walk. Yeah, I mean, it's funny that you bring up uh, people marching for cancer because I think you could look at that in two different ways. 
Um, on the one hand, you could see that cancer is this awful thing that is happening in this world. And on the other hand, you could look at police brutality the same way. I think police brutality is an awful reality in our world. And I think something like a Black Lives Matter rally where people are joining together and expressing their opinion that enough is enough, we're not going to stand for police brutality anymore, is a beautiful show of human support to say this group of people who have been routinely marginalized in this country, their lives matter, and we are going to unite our voices and say that. Do you think something like a Black Lives Matter rally is a part of the beauty of the world? I'm not going to say it's not part of the beauty, but all the black people and gays and all the outcasts, all they want is to be equal. So why do they have to have an entire thing for it? Why don't they have an all lives matter and all sexuality matters? Why has it got to be specific to one? Um, well, do you think something like black pride is anti-white? No, but you don't hear us marching about white supremacy or... Well, actually, there's some people out there that are still doing that. They're ignorant. But it's not like we're not going out there saying, hey, we're white and we're proud. I think everyone's great. I think everything depends on your personality. Like, I don't care if you're black, white, purple, yellow. To be proud of being part of a majority is different than expressing your pride of being part of a minority group. Do you know what I mean? I can see your point of view on that. Um, and now in terms of the gay pride parade, you know, like I feel, uh, I, I take part in gay pride marches. I think it's a beautiful way to come together. It's saying like in a world that in many, many ways does not encourage you to be proud of your sexual orientation or your gender identity or, or the way you love, um, you're banding together and saying, no, it, it is. So, so to me, something like a pride parade is actually a really beautiful part of this world. And, but you don't see it that way? Oh, yeah, sorry. I just got the little spider fell from the ceiling. Oh, what a, what a dream. Yeah, I know. Uh, I'm not saying that it's not a beautiful thing. I'm saying that I don't think we should... Like, answer me this. All gay people, transgender people, all of them, they want to be equal as us, correct? As straight people, as all of the world sees normal. Yeah. Right? I, I would love that. So why focus just on them? Why can't it be, uh, take out the word gay and just have a pride parade? Everyone can be happy for who they are. Everyone can show support for who they are. Well, Whether I, you're gay, straight, I don't know the other ones. Uh gay, straight, bisexual, those are sexual there orientations. There we go, that's what I was looking for. Yeah. Um, so you said in your message, you said being gay is a sin. Uh, wh why do you believe that? Mainly because, it, like I said, it comes back to my religion. I'm not the best Christian out there. I'm working on it. I try and get to church as often as I can, and I'm trying to... I know that you can't follow God's every commandment. You're going to slip up. But I try my best to follow everything that's in the Bible. And being gay is one of the big things in the Bible about, you know, homosexuality is a, an abomination. Those who practice homosexuality is, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's not my words. That's, I'm quoting the Bible. I just don't know exactly what verse. But I'm... I try my best to follow what the Bible says. And I do slip up a lot, trust me. But I try and do my best that I can. Yeah, so, so what, in, in your estimation, what is a good Christian? To be honest, I don't know if there is some such thing as a good Christian. We all, even in the Bible, it says, all shall fall short of the glory of God. When God created us, he created us in the image of him. And since that fateful day when Eve ate the apples in the Garden of Eden, we have been nothing. We've been nothing compared to what he is. And I think if you want to consider yourself a good Christian, it's just do whatever you can for the God. Give whatever you can to God. Pray to God. Go to church. And when you slip up, all you have to do is ask for forgiveness. But some people are just afraid of admitting that they did something wrong. I used to never think I did anything wrong. But admit, admitting it is one of the major things in being a quote-unquote good Christian.
The reason I'm bringing this up is if we are to follow the Christian doctrine and celebrate what God has created, don't you feel like a pride parade is a great way to celebrate what God has created? See, I believe God has made everyone, like I said, and even to this day, everyone's made in his image. But the devil gets onto us and gets it. I believe being just like a policeman, a police brutality going after a guy, that's a choice that that person made based on whatever's in his mind. In my mind, I believe that being gay is a choice. Okay. So you think... I don't mean to offend you. No, I, I, don't, I don't feel offended only because I, I know that I didn't choose this. Um, and I, it's helpful to just hear what you believe, even if it is uh, in direct opposition to what I know is true for me. Um, so, so just out of curiosity, why did you tack that to the end of your message? You, at the very end, uh, you said that being gay is a sin. Why did you want me to hear that? Uh, like I said, I was angry. I was, humans tend to type and say things out of anger that they wouldn't normally say. So I was basically, unfortunately, trying to hurt you. Mm. And it came back and bit me in the butt. So you feel like you're more right-leaning, more conservative, right? Uh, yes, sir. I feel like I'm conservative. Josh, you said that you're about to graduate high school, right? Mm-hmm. How is high school for you? Am I allowed to use the H-E double hockey stick word? Oh, yeah. You're allowed to. It was hell. <laughs> really? And it's still hell right now, even though it's only two weeks left. How have the last four years been hell? When you're different in any shape, form, or way, if you're not the quote-unquote popular girls, popular guys, football players, then you're not well-liked in I'm a little bit chubbier than a lot of people, and people seem to judge me before they get to know me. People seem to pick and choose who they like based on what you look like, who you are, rather, or what you look like rather than who you are, because when you're in high school, it's all about perfection. If you get your clothes from Walmart, you're an outcast. If you don't have the hottest new clothes, you're an outcast. I'm a little bit bigger. I don't like to use the word fat, but I am a little bit bigger than a lot of my classmates, and they seem to judge me before they even got to know me. I've been called a fat ass. I don't know if I can say that. Yeah, you're, you're allowed to. Okay. I've been called stupid, idiotic. I've been told nobody cares about me. I've been told to drink bleach. Just yesterday, someone told me I was ugly as hell. I don't exactly know how ugly hell is, but I don't think it's pretty. Well, I mean, that that's awful of them. I mean, I also just want to let you know, Josh, I was bullied in high school too. The older guys were always the ones who gave me a really hard time, and I will share something with you that happened one time in high school. Um, so this was um, – my best friend at the time, she was a girl, and she was dating this guy who was older than us, and he really didn't like me, and I knew he didn't like me from the beginning. Um, and it was on Halloween, and we all came to school in our costumes, and I dressed up as Waldo, you know, like, where's Waldo? Yeah. Um, and he was dressed up as a baseball player, and he had a full baseball player's outfit, so um, he asked to take a picture with me. Suddenly, what he did was right before the picture was taken, uh, he pulled his cup out from his underwear and pressed it on my face. And so immortalized forever in a picture that then hung in that best friend's room was a picture of him uh, holding his cup over my face. Did she stay with him? I think they broke up a few months later, but it that did not break them up. Um, yeah. I feel like I'm about to break into a sweat even telling you about it right now, but just to let you know that I have experienced um, a really fucked up form of bullying too. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 
this conversation is kind of weird for me because I feel like there is so much to you that I relate to, right? There's, I relate to the fact that you're bullied. Um, I relate to the fact that people kind of give you a hard time for who you are. And yet there are such fundamental things that we disagree on. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that we're similar or do you feel like that's, that's an unfair assertion? I think we're similar, but like you said, we have very different, we have similar lives, but very different beliefs. You're bullied, I'm bullied, but it's not for the same reason. Right. But I would actually argue and say that it is for a similar reason. I I think people um are very are very cruel to what they don't understand, right? Mhm. And you know, just to point out the irony of this, you wrote me a message that was pretty mean and it seems like it is a way that both you and I have been spoken to in high school. How did you feel writing this message to me? I just wanted to make you as mad or sad as possible. And like I said, it bit me in the butt. Well, you know, Josh, there's this phrase, um, hurt people hurt people. And um, I... Something that would happen in high school is I would take all of this shit that people were throwing on me and I would just get into huge fights with my parents. I didn't know why I was so mad at them, why I was so angry at them, but I think a large part of it is that I was absorbing all the shit that was thrown on at me in high school and directing it at people who would listen. Do you feel like there was maybe something similar that was happening with the message you sent to me? Uh, yeah. I'm not going to disagree on that. Yeah. Um, so, Josh, um, I know we don't see the world in the exact same way, but like I said, I think there are key similarities that we have. Um how do you feel that people like you and me can have productive conversations? I think that if you're trying to have a conversation with someone that's completely different than you, then take everything away that makes us different and just have a conversation. Like, I could have a conversation with you right now, and if you never said anything, I wouldn't know you were gay. Mm -hmm. So just, I guess, instead of trying to be, you be Dylan, I be Josh, we just be human and mm -hmm. be able to just talk to each other like humans instead of like a straight guy to a gay guy or right. just hide the differences. Right. I, I mean, and I'm not, I'm not saying for you to hide who you are. Mm -hmm. I'm saying to, if you're trying to have a conversation or get along with someone, don't just like stick on to that one subject. Like I'm not going to go around saying, Hey, I'm straight. Right, I mean, but the world assumes that we are all straight, which is why coming out, coming out of the closet even exists, right? Because we have to assert like, oh, no, I'm not what you expect me to be. Um, and the only thing I would argue is that you said put differences aside. And I would disagree with that because I think the way to talk to each other is to embrace differences, um, to say – you were raised very differently than I was and you believe very different things and those differences are going to, they're part of who we are. So the way, you know, being gay, it's not just something I can ignore. It's in fact, I think a part of who I am just as the way, as the things you believe are a part of who you are. Um, and I think we can still achieve conversation through that. Do you agree? There's certain people, but there are certain people out there that are not going to be as easygoing with someone being gay or someone being different, a minority. I feel like having, trying to not just be the same, but trying to stay as similar as you can to each other just to get through a conversation, if that makes sense. So, Josh, do you, um, do you have any questions for me? 
No, but I do have a comment. Yeah. Don't change based on what other people say. There are people out there who don't accept people, anyone who's different. They don't accept the fact that you're fat. They don't accept the fact that you're gay. That doesn't mean you should change. Ah, I stepped on a Lego. Oh, no. Josh, are you okay? (laughs) Yeah, that was my little brother. Oh, I'm sorry, Josh. Okay, yeah. But, like, the comment I was just trying to let you know is, uh, don't change who you are just because someone wants you to. Like, I think you're a great guy. You're pretty cool. But just because I don't agree with the choices you make or the choices you're born with, whichever way you look at it, doesn't mean I don't agree with you. Because I can hate, as God says, I can hate the sin. Doesn't mean I have to hate the sinner. So don't let some stupid comment like the one I made or the one I'm pretty sure a lot of people make to a lot of gay guys, different people, just because people will not accept you because you're fat, you're different, you're a minority, you're transgender. It doesn't mean you should change. If you're not willing to be who you are, then nothing will ever change. If I'm not willing to show you who I am, nothing will change. If you're not willing to be gay, if you're not willing to be the true Dylan Marin, then nothing's going to change for you. You're just going to live in this hellhole forever. But if you don't let people get to you, if you don't change based off what people say, you'll make the world a hell of a lot better. Well, Josh, thank you for saying that. I mean, do you feel like this conversation has been productive? I think it has. I know a lot of gay guys at my school who are just like you, but they're afraid to come out. And that is what's hurting them. Because if they would just be who they are, if they don't let bigots like me keep them in the closet, this world could be hell of a lot better. It could be amazing. Well, but it's people like me, people like the bullies that bullied you, that bully me. It's those people who are ruining this world right now, not y'all. Well, Josh, do you feel like this conversation is going to encourage you to offer them those kids who might be in the closet or might be trying to come out of the closet? Do you think that this conversation might uh, inspire you to offer them a helping hand, even if you don't fully agree with, um, as you say, their sin? I can't tell you for sure what the future holds for me and my beliefs in going out there, but I can tell you it's given me a lot to think about. (laughs) It's shown me a different life than I... It's like I was in one room and I barred myself off from the rest of the world and now I'm out and I can see someone else's point of view. And you're saying you got that from this conversation? A lot of it, yeah. I'm going to try to see points of view from other people, not just the views that I've been taught throughout my life. It's time for me to stop listening, not stop listening, but stop taking in everything my parents believe and make my own decision. Well, cool. Um, well, I I wish you luck on that journey. It is a difficult journey that I think uh, many of us have, have gone down, and uh, I wish you a lot of luck for it. Um, Josh, Thank you. It was, uh, it was a total pleasure talking to you today. The pleasure is all mine. Um, well, I hope I'll talk to you soon, okay? Yes, sir. You have a great day. All right. Well, bye, Josh. <laughs> it, was, it was great to talk to you. Bye. You too. Conversations with People Who Hate Me is a production of Night Vale Presents. Christy Gressman is the executive producer. Vincent Cascione is the sound engineer and mixer. Alan Rahimik is the production manager. The theme song is These Dark Times by Caged Animals. The logo was designed by Rob Wilson. And this podcast was created, produced, and hosted by me, Dylan Marin. Special thanks to Night Vale Presents Director of Marketing, Adam Cecil, our publicist, Christine Ragasa, and also Dustin Flannery McCoy, Rob Silcox, Mark Maloney, and production assistants, Allison Goldberger and Emily Muller. Thank you to all of those who gave encouragement throughout this process, and also thank you to those who warned me against doing this project. 
I did it anyway. And yes, thank you to those who wrote the hateful messages, comments, and posts that inspired me to turn one-way negativity into productive two-way conversations. Thank you so much for listening, and we will be back with another conversation next week. If you love this show, tell all of your friends about it. And if you hated this show, maybe write to me. Tell me why you hated it. And who knows, maybe you'll be a guest on the show. Just remember, there is a human on the other side of the screen. We're racing, racing through these dark times. And it's hard to take it. But we're going to make it through these dark times. Make it through these dark times. Dark times